There is a place in the middle of the Atlantic with lush vegetation, impressive landscapes, and where its people are living among volcanoes. We are going to Sao Miguel in the Azores. Before we begin, let's put the Azores on the map. The Azores Archipelago is a small cluster of nine islands in the middle of the North Atlantic that formed as a result of the Azores hotspot and the Mid-Atlantic Rift. Today, we will look at the volcanic nature of the main island of Sao Miguel. When you first arrive at Ponta Delgada, which is the main city on Sao Miguel, you can't help but be fascinated by the interesting architecture and bustling city life that this town has to offer. Just about everything you need on the mainland is available here. But you can't forget that this is a volcanic island formed by violent eruptions and remains active to this day. We'll explore some of the main attractions from west to east and we begin with the southwestern part of the island where you can find geothermal springs that feed right into the ocean. This location is also the site of one of the more recent eruptions from a vent that feeds off one of the main calderas on the westernmost part of the island. Basaltic sea stacks and sea arches form part of this impressive coastline. Our next stop takes us to the rim of a large caldera, the main caldera of Sete Cidades, about five kilometers or three miles wide is actually composed of six pyroclastic craters within the large caldera that collapsed about 22,000 years ago. Caldera do Alferes, which formed during an eruption around 2050 BC, and Caldera Seca, which last erupted in 1444. Two lakes, Azul and Verde, make up the two main depressions within the Sete Cidades caldera. The lakes are also prone to eutrophication, where excess nutrients lead to algal blooms. The phosphorus and nitrogen inputs come from the agricultural activities, including livestock as well. Eutrophication happens most often in the northern part of the Green Lake, leading to excess aquatic plant growth and giving it the green color. Here's a panorama of the entire caldera system of Sete Cidades, and you can see how the floor of the caldera is populated with farms and a small town. You can also appreciate how steep the walls are, which make it hard to find outcrops with the lush vegetation. On a road cut across the lip of the crater is an impressive outcrop of about 30 or 40 feet high that shows a nice sequence of ash flows. As you walk up to the outcrop, you can see that it consists of relatively small pumice fragments. I picked up one of the larger fragments to peek at some of the details of this frothy material. Up close, you can see this sponge-like glassy texture with lots of air pockets. Some people also describe it as bread-like. Nevertheless, this shows how explosive and full of gas the original magma was. Pumice fragments are plentiful on this island, and plumes of pumice fragments were sprayed in different directions depending upon the orientation of the vents as well as the weather. Here's a nice outcrop on the northwest coast of Sao Miguel, and what we have here are some large blocky flows, blocky lava, and then right on top, you start to see a contact, which we did a little close-up of, and in that contact, you can see some very small bits, walnut-sized uh, fragments that are all fused together. And then you have some uh, pumice layers, a variety of different things here uh, with different eruptive sequences. And on the beach, we have a lot of pumice fragments that came from eruptions probably within the last 10,000 years. As you step up to the contact, you see some slightly rounded, broken basalt fragments and then finer material sitting on top of it. Pretty typical of a pyroclastic flow. Size of these fragments, probably one or two inches. 
The volcanic blocks have some squeezed vesicles or gas pockets and here we have a fairly large one. Not surprising, we have a black sand beach and it too contains very small pumice fragments. So what you have behind me is a sequence of jumbled up material. And this is most likely a landslide from some of that material that was above us that slid down. And right in here, there's a contact surface between this jumbled up material and the darker uh, lavas and other sequence. Because, and the thing you can tell about landslides is all the jumbled up broken fragments because just across the way, are some nice horizontal layers, okay? And this is probably what most of this looked like before the slide. Landslides are really common on this island because the topography is steep and they get a lot of rainfall and moisture that loosens that material. And when you get tremors or anything that might trigger uh, some kind of mass movement, this is what you end up with. Driving along the north coast, you can find a tea plantation, which apparently is the tea capital of all of Europe. The favorable weather and lack of pesticides makes this a unique place to grow tea. About 33 tons a year of it. The Goriana Tea Factory has been in operation for over 130 years. As you drive along the north coast, there are numerous little peninsulas and outcrops with some very interesting exposures of volcanic events. One of them grabbed my attention to have a closer look. I was walking along a trail on the coast, not far from Ribera Grande, and here is a little syncline of some of the ash layers. And just right along the trail. And it's on the way to some remarkable scenery. So let's take a look at some of these layers. You can see a lot of little fragments, volcanic fragments. There are some layers with pumice fragments. Uh, it's recently rained, so things are very wet. Yeah, this is fascinating. And we can see some differential erosion here between the different layers. It's pretty spectacular. Here's a close-up of the underside of one of the layers. And then you have the odd rocks and blocks that resist erosion compared to the finer material. From the coast, it was a short drive up and over the summit pass to another volcanic lake. This is the Lagoa de Fogo, one of the youngest and most active uh, volcanic centers on this island of Sao Miguel. The caldera formed about 15,000 years ago and actually in 1560, Three or so there was a small eruption in this little end of the lake uh, and that's this is the youngest of all the volcanoes here it's still very active and if you look closely there are some uh, geothermal bubbles or carbon dioxide releases in the smaller part of the lake here or the front part of the lake so here we see in a nice outcrop along the top crater lip are uh, a huge layer of fragments of pumice so all these things are part of a, the final spattering of one of the volcano events or eruptions. Um, and it's just sputtering out a lot of ash and pumice pieces. One of the hazards to Lagoa de Fogo 
is the lowest part of the rim, which is only a few meters above the lake level. Should this break in a future eruption, the downstream inhabitants have to contend with a lahar flood as well as any eruptive byproducts. Our next stop takes us to an area that is very lush and humid due to the climate and water that feeds into yet another lake. We're at Lagoa de Furnas, which is the crater lake to Furnas volcano. And this thing is still active. There's a lot of geothermal activity. There's a botanical garden with some warm water coming through. And at the far end of the lake, there are some fumaroles. Now the question is, should this thing become active again, we have a major phreatic eruption, which is a lot of steam that goes along with any of the ash or other volcanic products when this thing erupts. The last time this thing erupted was about 1630, created a lot of havoc and destruction, and it's well overdue for another eruption again. A geophysical study of mapping the uh, lake bed floor happened several years ago by a Swedish group and they found that there's a little cone at the bottom of this lake and that was probably the cone that was produced in the 1630 eruption. They also found there are a lot of CO2 seeps, in other words carbon dioxide gas is seeping off the bottom. So this thing is far from dead, far from extinct. It is dormant but there's still a lot of activity percolating around and when all the conduits become plugged and the pressure builds up from the magma chamber that's about five kilometers deep, we could get a big eruption here at the surface. Geothermal springs and activity are a part of life in the town of Furness. In fact, you can find springs right alongside some of the residential buildings and streets with varying degrees of activity. Water that percolates down from the surface mixes with the groundwater and dissolve minerals to produce springs with different colors and chemistries. Some local inhabitants attribute their health to the different mineral content in these waters. Okay, so a lot of this water seems to have healing properties, so do as the locals do and drink some, right? Kind of tastes like carbonated water or soda with a strong hard water or iron taste. Okay. <laughs> the town of Furnace and the entire island of Sao Miguel will leave you amazed at the local landscape, the prospects of future eruptions, and how the Azorians have come to accept this risk and still choose to live among volcanoes. Yeah.